Welcome to the fifth lecture for the module Metaphysics uh, of the term. This week we're moving on to the topic of causation, um, which we'll find to be related um, to the topic of uh, possibility and necessity, which we've been covering um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, we're going to particularly see that not with this lecture, but with the next lecture where we relate uh, causation to counterfactuals. Um, this week's lecture concerns um, another approach to causation, um, which is sometimes known as the regularity approach to causation. Um, so we'll, um, it's quite a traditional view, um, um, fallen a little bit out of favour recently for reasons that we'll see, although uh, it does retain some, some degree of popularity. Um, so um, I'll move on to the slides. Basically, um, I suppose the just just before doing so, um, just a bit of a word about why we study causation in philosophy. So, um, causation um, is very sort of ubiquitous in our thinking about the world and the way we talk about the world, um, because we appeal to causation in order to uh, try to explain what's going on around us, try to predict what's going to happen in the future, um, and also maybe try to control events. So uh, think about, for instance, the, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we're interested in the causes of that um, for a number of reasons, right? So if we, we know what, the, what caused it, um, maybe it was um, some interaction between uh, bats and livestock, um, then um, that will help us to understand why it happened. Um, it will hopefully enable us to uh, prevent outbreaks of um, uh, diseases, uh, flus and coronaviruses in uh, humans in future, or at least to control the number of outbreaks in future, um, but also may, maybe to predict where they're likely to arise, right? So, for instance, if this hypothesis is right, then contexts in which bats are able to interact with livestock um, might be a, a, a case where we might predict that that, that could happen, uh, and we might seek to, to prevent these further uh, outbreaks by controlling the possibilities for that to happen. So causation is really enormously important um, to us as humans, our well-being, um, our ability to understand, predict, and control the world around us. So um, <clears throat> it's an important topic for sure. Um, um, and it, philosophers study it also in part because it's somewhat mysterious. So what exactly is causation? Um, if you're pushed, um, then unless you've studied the philosophy of causation, then um, you will uh, and even if you have, then then it's probably going to be somewhat difficult to, to answer that question. What is causation? What exactly are we saying when we say that um, X causes Y, that um, interactions between bats and livestock caused the cor uh, coronavirus outbreak? So what does that mean? What does the cause mean? Um, it's a bit mysterious. It's not something that, you know, we sort of um, seem to directly observe, um, you know, so causation you know isn't like rain right we we just see rain happening do we really see causation happening um not not obviously in the same same way there's not sort of stuff causation that that we can observe in the same way so that that's the sort of reason that philosophers have got interested in it so often when they there are these phenomena that you know are important but um don't really seem to correspond to anything directly observable then we might think well you know this is a theoretical notion um it would be good if we could somehow reduce it or explain it maybe in sort of more familiar terms maybe in terms of things that are directly observable for instance and and so that's that's really a starting point and certainly the starting point for the regularity tradition in the philosophy of causation that we're going to examine um this week so let me uh, just switch to the slides here. So uh, I'll just full screen these. So, um, so really, the kind of 
modern, I mean, although Aristotle um, and others spoke about causation um, much earlier than Hume, um, Hume, in a way, is thought of as uh, kind of the founder of modern theorizing, modern philosophical theorizing about causation. Um, and his influence remains to this day. So he endorsed um, uh, what's become known as a regularity theory of causation. So if you remember, I said causation is not something that we can straightforwardly observe. It doesn't seem it's not like rain. Um, so maybe we could understand it in terms of things that we can observe. And that was sort of something that Hume was very much interested in seeking to do. Um, and so his suggestion uh, was that we understand causation as follows. So um, he thought of causation as a relation between events, right? So that that's relatively common among philosophers to think that uh, events are things that cause each other. So um, interactions between uh, bats and livestock, uh, an interaction between them might be an event. Uh, the outbreak of, of a pandemic might be another event. Uh, and we claim this on causal, causal relation between them. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, well, according to Hume, um, uh, where C and E events then um, essentially C's causing E consists in three elements, right? So firstly, uh, C occurs before E in time, right? So causes occur earlier than their effects is Hume's idea, which seems um, sensible. Um, so um, certainly in our ordinary experience, causes uh, occur prior to their effects. Um, we're, we're not very familiar with any notion of backwards in time causation, so a later event causing an earlier one. Now, you could sort of argue with Hume that maybe it's not altogether impossible um, that there should be backwards causation. Uh, we'll look at that a bit more uh, later in term when we talk about the possibility of time travel. Um, so, in... Um, um, for instance, in um, contemporary physics, th there seems to be some possibility that you might have uh, so-called wormholes in space-time. Um, so these could, in principle, allow um, uh, a later event to, in a sense, cause an earlier event. So, uh, for instance, a um, uh, you, you could potentially... Um, I'm not... Sure, I mean, this is sort of astronomically unlikely that you'd in practice be able to do this, but uh, potentially travel through uh, a, a wormhole uh, back to an earlier point in time and cause some event in the distant past, right? So that's that arguably that's a theoretical possibility, and so some people might contest this criterion of causation, but certainly. In our ordinary experience, causes occur prior to their effects. <clears throat> the second uh, criterion that Hume advanced is that um, a cause and effect must be contiguous in space and time. In other words, next to one another in space time. There's no sort of action at a distance um, that's not mediated. So, um, there's this important qualification that Hume gives, right? So um, uh, he says, okay, I mean, actually, strictly speaking, it can be that a cause occurs somewhere in space-time that's removed from its effect. But where that's so, there's always going to be a kind of intermediate chain of causation um, where each link in the chain is uh, a case of contiguous causation. So, uh, for example, um, you might say that um, the um, uh, the the yeah. So, I mean, it might be like you might say that the co the interaction between um, uh, between livestock and bats is what caused uh, me to 
have to give this lecture uh, at home, recording uh, recording it rather than in person in London, right? So uh, there, the putative cause, the bat livestock interaction, occurred um, rather a long time before, you know, over a year before, um, and probably. Uh, rather spatially distant from um, my recording this lecture, which is the putative effect. Um, however, that's okay for Hume, provided we could trace a um, process, a chain of causation, um, which involves at every stage uh, spatio-temporally contiguous uh, uh, um, interactions. Um, so, uh, you know, it might be that the, the interaction between the bats and livestock um, immediately caused a uh, uh, virus to be transmitted to the livestock. Um, then the, li the, the virus was sustained in the livestock until humans ate the livestock or came into interaction with the livestock. Uh, and then the, the um, the virus was transmitted to humans and so on and so on, all the way to get to uh, me sitting in this room recording the lecture. So, um, so the, the the real criterion for cause, uh, causation that Hume advocates is that well, either C and E are going to be contiguous, or at least there's going to be a, a series of events connecting them um, that at each stage involves a conti uh, contiguous link of causation. Um, and then the third criterion for Hume, um, which is really the most important, is the reason why Hume is known as a regularity theorist about causation. Um, and this is the criterion that um, the events that are, are putative cause and effect must be of types um, that are, as Hume puts it, constantly conjoined. Um, or regularly occur together. Uh, so that's where the regularity comes in. So what what does that mean? What's constant conjunction mean? Well, uh, what Hume says is that basically events like C, like a putative cause, must always be followed uh, in close proximity or via a chain involving close proximity by events like E, if we're to say that C is a cause of E. So it must be that, for instance, if the, um, uh, the say the, the livestock bat interactions were a cause of virus in humans, um, then, um, Every time you got um, a, a human uh, livestock bat interaction, this would be followed by uh, virus in humans, at least via some uh, contiguous chain of events. Now, you you might sort of immediately worry about this, and you know it seems reasonable to do so because you might think, well, isn't that a bit strong? You know, so can't it be the case that in this instance? Uh, livestock bat interactions caused a virus in humans, even though it's it's not going to be true that in every instance they do so. So I think, you know, you're right to worry about this. So there are a couple of things Hume might say about this. Um, I suppose maybe the, the most persuasive might be that, you know, maybe there were some particular factors present on this occasion where the bats and livestock interacted uh, that meant that uh, in this case a pandemic in humans was caused um, um, but uh, they're not present in every case and that's why sometimes we don't get a pandemic following a livestock bat interaction. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment, um, that sort of view. Um, Hume doesn't actually himself say much about this sort of case. Um, and part, maybe it's partly because Hume often in his examples focuses on rather simpler um, examples of causation. So he, for instance, talks about 
one billiard ball impacting upon another and then the second one moving right so in that case you know it's pretty plausible you do get a constant conjunction you know whenever you hit one billiard ball with another uh, at least with the right force then the second one will move um so maybe maybe in some way this is a uh, uh Hume is misled by the simplicity of his own examples. But this is something we'll come back to in a moment. Um, um, so Mill, um, in particular, uh, was uh, one to sort of recognise this additional complication. Um, so obviously a lot of you will have heard of Mill, um, probably because of his work in ethics and political philosophy, so utilitarianism and liberalism. Not so much for his work on causation, but he, he had some interesting things to say about causation too. So so here's what Mill says, picking up on the point that, that I just made. Um, so Mill says, well, it's rare that a single event um, is enough to bring about another event. So that the events like the second one, E, uh, always follow events like the first one, C. Um, so... Um, the example we've been considering is the human, uh, the livestock bat interactions and the human pandemic, right? So it might be that um, simple uh, livestock bat interactions aren't enough to guarantee that there's going to be a pandemic, uh, but you also need some other features, right? So maybe something to do with the human handling of the... The, the livestock subsequently, maybe features to do with um, uh, the, the viral load in the bats and so on. Um, uh, we can, I mean, so we're going to consider a bit of a simpler example. Um, uh, might be best to start off a, a little bit simpler uh, before building up such complex e examples as um, uh, the causes of pandemics. Um, so think of, uh, actually, this example comes from Mackey. So um, hopefully many of you will have already read about it. Um, um, consider the relationship between a short circuit and a house fire. Um, so put in terms of that example, Mill's point would be, it's not the case that whenever you get a short circuit, then you get a fire in a house, right? Not Mill's example, Mackey's example, but uh, it will illustrate Mill's point. Um, and that sort of seems to contradict what Hume's saying about causation, because Hume seems to say, well, if the short circuit is a cause, then there must be constant conjunction so that every time you get a short circuit, you get a fire. Mill says, well, that's not really so. Uh, certainly if we insist that causes must always be followed by the associated effect, then simple events like short circuits are not going to typically get classified as causes. Mill says, so rather a, a complex of events is normally what's required to bring about a particular effect. So the short circuit on its own wouldn't be enough for the fire to follow. So we, we wouldn't get fire whenever we get short circuits in other words so um, rather uh, we might point out that we need flammable material to be present we need oxygen to be present um, and to anticipate what Mackey says we need there to be kind of the absence of a, an effective sprinkler system if we're to get a full-blown house fire um, so it's not the short circuit on its own, but only in, in conjunction with these other things uh, that we have any guarantee of a house fire. Now, Mill says that it's quite common in ordinary language to single out a single one of these things. So if we take the, the set of things consisting of the short circuit, the presence of the flammable material, the presence of the oxygen, the absence of a sprinkler system. We have kind of a set of conditions that are relevant to the fire. 
Mill points out that it's quite common to single out just one of these conditions, maybe the short circuit, and call that the cause. He says that's, or he thinks that's the sort of thing we do in everyday talk. Um, whereas we'll treat the others, uh, maybe the presence of the flammable material and so on, as mere conditions, background conditions, if you like. Um, so it's sort of interesting. There's There's been some debate in philosophy around this. This does seem to be a tendency in ordinary language to sort of um, emphasise one factor and call it the cause, um, even though there are other factors that seem relevant. Um, and there's a debate about why this is. So one hypothesis um, is that we tend to pick out uh, whichever of the relevant conditions was kind of the most exceptional um, and maybe, you know, a short circuit's kind of exceptional, it's not, not normal, um, whereas, you know, in a house, the presence of flammable material is, is pretty normal, right? Many houses have lots of wood in them or, you know, at least furniture and so on that's flammable. Um, presence of oxygen, even more obviously, seems to be a sort of a, uh, an expected or normal condition, at least here on Earth. Um, uh, and yeah, maybe the absence of a sprinkler system is fairly normal as well. So that there might be things to say about why we happen in ordinary talk to select one relevant factor as the cause and call the others mere background conditions. But um, Mill thinks that strictly speaking, or as he says, philosophically speaking, the real cause is the conjunction of all the relevant factors. So the real cause is a complex consisting of the short circuit, the presence of flammable material, the presence of oxygen, the absence of a sprinkler system, and anything else that might be relevant. So, in a sense, you know, uh, Mill makes a point that uh, Hume doesn't, that, you know, Hume, when he's writing about this, makes it sound as though you're going to get constant conjunctions between individual events like short circuits and fires um, and that where you do the uh, uh, the earlier event is the cause the, sh the short circuit in this case um, Mill's making the point that you know actually um, you don't you don't always get regularity between uh, simple events uh, like short circuits um, and effects like fires uh, but rather it's only short circuits taken together with other conditions like flammable material oxygen and so on um, that are invariably succeeded by fires um, so they they don't differ hugely in that the both take um, this sort of regularity or constant conjunction to be the sign of causation and hence both are classified as regularity theorists about causation. They just differ in that Mill acknowledges that uh, these regularities are typically only going to occur between complexes of events um, and effects. Uh, rather than single causal events and effects. Okay, so Mackey, um, uh, whose paper's on the reading list, um, in many ways uh, was the the uh, regular sort of contemporary, or at least reasonably contemporary. It's a bit uh, old now. Um, regularity theorist that. Um, you know, has, whose account has, has been taken in, in a way most seriously um, of all. Um, and But he, he's very much building upon um, things said by, by Hume and Mill and certainly falls in the same 
tradition that they do as a regularity theorist. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of similarity between what he says and what Mill in particular says. So, um, Mackey uh, agrees with Mill, essentially, that um, n normally, in order to guarantee an effect, um, like a fire, uh, you're going to need a complex set of conditions. Um, uh, and a single simple condition like a short circuit isn't isn't always going to be followed by a fire, uh, but it would only be taken together with the other factors that it that it would be invariably followed by a fire. Now, Mackey, in, to help sort of think about this, um, introduces the notion of what he calls an inus condition. So he says that causes are often inus conditions of their effect. Um, so in order to see what that means, we need to, a bit of background. So it's a sort of technical notion. Um, so just going with the same example, he points out, Mackey points out that a short circuit isn't necessary for a fire, right? You could, that is, uh, have the fire started in some other way, right? So an overturned candle could cause a house fire just as well as a short circuit could. Um, also, he points out, and this follows Mill, that a short circuit isn't sufficient for a fire. So you need flammable material and oxygen, absence of effective sprinkler systems and so on, in order to get something that's going to guarantee a fire. Rather, Mackey says, a short circuit is what he calls an inus condition of a fire. So this is rather a mouthful. It's an insufficient but non-redundant part of a set of conditions which is unnecessary but sufficient for the fire. Right, so that's, as I say, a bit of a mouthful, a bit difficult to kind of pass um, uh, when you read it or hear it. Um, but let's explain what's going on. Think of the set of conditions, uh, the sort of one that we considered when we were talking about mill, um, that, you know, maybe arguably at least is enough to guarantee the fire. So maybe this consists of the short circuit, some oxygen, some flammable material, the absence of a sprinkler system, if you get all of these conditions together, maybe there are some others you can think of that we need to throw in, then the idea is that jointly this set of conditions is sufficient for the fire. It's enough to guarantee that the fire will occur. Um, but it's unnecessary, right? So we've already seen this. The fire could have started in some other way, right? So in particular, the short circuit's unnecessary because... Uh, if a candle had been overturned, the fire could have started that way instead. Okay, so the, this set of conditions, it's sufficient, but it's unnecessary. Another set of conditions where, for instance, we replaced the short circuit with an overturned candle would have equally been sufficient. When we pay attention to the short circuit alone, just one member of this set of conditions, uh, individually it's insufficient um, for the fire and this is just Mill's point that um, we need the other conditions in the set to get uh, uh, something that's sufficient for the fire nevertheless although the, the short circuit is alone insufficient it is non-redundant to this set of conditions that is to say if we took the short circuit out of the set of conditions and didn't replace it with anything else, like an overturned candle, um, then the remaining conditions on their own wouldn't suffice for the fire. So, in other words, the presence of oxygen, the absence, oh, sorry, the presence of oxygen, the presence of flammable material, and the absence of a sprinkler system, those three conditions on their own aren't enough for a fire. You need the short circuit, or you need something like that, right? So the short circuit's non-redundant. You can't simply subtract it from that set 
without replacing it with something like an overturned candle um, and hope that what remains is a, a sufficient set. Um, so taking the initials from these terms, so it's an insufficient but non-redundant part of a set of conditions which is unnecessary but sufficient for the fire, taking those initials he calls the short circuit an inus condition of the fire. Now, uh, Mackey doesn't exactly equate causes with inus conditions. Um, so, inus conditions are, if you like, one sort of cause, um, but you can have other sorts of cause, right? So, actually, what Mackey says is that a cause is at least an inus condition of its effect. Um, what does this mean? Well, he doesn't want to preclude that you could have individual causes that are both necessary and sufficient, even on their own, or just necessary or just sufficient for their effects, right? So um, many causes might just be ionous conditions, but some might actually be necessary for their effects and or sufficient for their effects. He doesn't want to rule that out. Uh, he just wants to say that you don't, in order to be a cause, you don't have to be necessary and or sufficient. You could just be an ionous condition. So are there examples, genuine examples of necessary and sufficient causes? Well, maybe, right? So it might be, for instance, that the Earth's temperature being within a certain range is a necessary cause of life on Earth, right? It might be that um, if the temperature had been outside of that range, then life on Earth would have just been impossible. Um, so this is a disanalogy to the relationship between the short circuit and the fire. The fire could have occurred without the short circuit by an overturned candle, for instance. The hypothesis here is that maybe life on Earth couldn't have occurred uh, if temperature had been outside a certain range. Maybe... Possibly there are also sufficient causes. So it may be if a window is hit by a sledgehammer um, and breaks, maybe it's being hit with a sledgehammer was sufficient for its breaking, right? So it all on its own, hitting the window with a sledgehammer guaranteed that it breaks. So arguably, right, you might argue not. Um, may maybe the... the uh, window has to be uh, made of suitably fragile material and so on. Um, but the point is just that Mackey doesn't want to rule out the possibility of sufficient causation. Maybe there are causes that are necessary and sufficient, so maybe the Big Bang was a necessary and sufficient condition of the creation of the universe. Um, again, arg arguably, um, something Mackey doesn't want to rule out. Okay. Now, one thing to note, I suppose, is that um, Mackey, uh, and this sort of distinguishes him from Mill, is perfectly happy for us to treat the individual members of a set of conditions as causes. So he thinks it's perfectly legitimate to say that the short circuit um, was a cause of the fire given that the short circuit is an ionous condition of the fire. Remember, Mill says that, strictly speaking, or philosophically speaking, it's only the whole set that counts as a cause. So Mackey makes no such requirement. Um, he's happy to go with the way people ordinarily talk and say that the members of the set can be causes, uh, so long as they're ionous conditions. Um, so in a sense, that that's a bit more like Hume's way of talking, where he's talking about single events being causes of other single events. Okay, Mackey has a bit more to say, right? So he doesn't just say that a cause is at least an inus condition. He puts some further uh, requirements on causation. Um, and, you know, these are a bit difficult to understand in the abstract, but we'll see how they work when we come on to the 
challenges of overdetermination and preemption shortly. So, so he says that if C, event C is to be a cause of E, then C's got to be at least an inus condition of E. So, as I say, it could be a mere inus condition, or it could be a necessary and or sufficient condition all on its own. Uh, Mill doesn't want to rule that out. Requirement two, all conditions in some minimally sufficient set free of which C as a non-redundant member were present, right? So that, that you know, that's, that's a, sounds a bit abstract, maybe a bit difficult to understand in the abstract, but actually can be explained fairly simply. What Mackey is saying is that if the short circuit, which is an inus condition, is to count as the cause of the fire, it's got to be the case that these other conditions were also present, right? The conditions with which the short circuit combined in order to guarantee the fire, right? So his idea would be that if the short circuit occurred and even though in theory there's a set of conditions with which the short circuit might combine to bring about a fire. In practice, if one of them turns out to be absent, right, so if we find out that, um, in fact, there was a sprinkler system there, then we might start to look elsewhere for a cause of the fire. So you might start to think, well, maybe it wasn't the short circuit, maybe it was the lightning strike, I suppose. I suppose there was a lightning strike on the roof of the house. Maybe that, uh, which the, the sprinklers couldn't do much about, um, then then maybe we think that actually that's the cause and not the short circuit. So that's a requirement here, condition two. All conditions in some minimally sufficient set free of which C is a non-redundant member were present. And the third one um is that no minimally sufficient set that doesn't include C was present. So we're going to come back to that. We'll see why why he requires that. Okay. So let's introduce a problem that can be appreciated without uh, yet worrying too much about condition three. Um, although we'll see how condition three interacts with this problem in a moment. Suppose, so this, this problem is a, a kind of well-known problem in the causation literature, and we'll see um, in the next lecture that this problem isn't just a problem for the regularity view, um, but it turns out to be a problem for the counterfactual view uh, of causation too. So here's an example of overdetermination. Suppose that lightning strikes a barn in which straw is stored. So we have lightning, flammable material, presumably the presence of oxygen and so on. Suppose at that very moment, by sheer coincidence, an arsonist throws a petrol bomb into the barn. Okay. So again, we've got petrol bomb, flammable material, presence of oxygen and so on. Now, here we have um, two minimally sufficient sets of conditions. So two uh, sets of conditions that are sufficient for the fire um, and of which all members are non-redundant. So set one consists of the presence of flammable material, Maybe I should add the presence of oxygen, maybe the absence of heavy enough rain uh, to put the fire out, um, and a lightning strike. Um, set two consists of the presence of flammable material, the absence of heavy enough rain, maybe the presence of oxygen, you know, maybe, maybe you can add some other things, um, and the presence of the petrol bomb. Now, this, okay, so, so what we can say is that the lightning strike is an inus condition of the fire, 
right? So set one is sufficient for the fire. The lightning strike alone isn't sufficient for the fire. It's insufficient for the fire because you need the flammable material, the absence of sufficient heavy rain, etc. Um, and, well, I mean, lightning strikes are necessary because obviously the fire can come back and come about in some other way, like fire a petrol bomb. Um, but the lightning strike is a non-redundant element of this set, right, set one. So the mere presence of flammable material and maybe oxygen and the absence of heavy rain, those three things on their own aren't enough to bring about a fire. You need something else like a lightning strike or maybe alternatively a petrol bomb. Um, so the lightning strike is uh, um, insufficient but non-redundant element of a set that is unnecessary but sufficient for the fire. So in other words, the lightning strike is an inus condition. The trouble, is, well, the trouble is, in a way, the trouble is that so is the petrol bomb, right? So the petrol bomb is also an ionis condition of the fire. Um, uh, again, it's not enough on its own because you need these other conditions in set two, uh, but it's non-redundant. The other conditions in set two, all on their own, without anything else, won't bring about a fire. Um, um, Right, so so again, the the petrol bomb uh, works out as an as an ionis condition of the fire, just like the lightning strike. Now, okay, so fine, so you know maybe we we um, uh, we're going to get the result from Mackey's account that both the lightning strike and the petrol bomb were causes of the fire, which might seems like it might be fine. But actually, that's not so, and that's because of the condition that we haven't really discussed so far yet, um, which is condition three, that says no minimally sufficient set that doesn't include C was present, right? So consider the lightning strike. Is there a minimally sufficient set present on the occasion in question for the fire that doesn't include the lightning strike. Well, yes, there's set two. That's minimally sufficient and doesn't include the lightning strike. So condition three seems to rule out the lightning strike as a cause of the fire. Now consider the petrol bomb, right? So it's an ionis condition. That's fine. The other members in the set, um, a present, so that's fine. So we've got conditions one and two ticked. Uh, but the problem again comes in condition three. Condition three says no minimally sufficient set that doesn't include C. This time we're considering the petrol bomb as the potential cause. Uh, it says no, no minimally sufficient set that doesn't include the petrol bomb was present. Well, actually, yes, yes, there was one present, namely the set one that it just consists of the flammable material, the absence of heavy rain, and the lightning strike. So actually, it looks like Mackey's account rules out both the petrol bomb and the lightning strike as causes. Um, now, that sort of seems kind of weird. Um, I think so. most people's reaction would be that in a case of overdetermination, we have more causes than we need, right? We've got all lightning strike and the petrol bomb. But actually, Mackey's account is giving the result that we have no causes, right? Or at least neither the lightning strike nor the petrol bomb will cause us. Maybe these other things like flammable material will cause us. But it, it sort of seems very odd to say that neither the lightning strike nor the petrol bomb will cause us. Um, um, most people probably would want to say they're both causes. So... Mackey, Mackey thinks it's not a problem, right? So he thinks that it actually, we would hesitate in such an overdetermination case to say that either's cause. So we, it might, and it, you know, maybe he's on something. So maybe 
because of the petrol bomb, we might hesitate to say that the lightning strike was a cause. Maybe because of the lightning strike, we might hesitate to say that the petrol bomb was a cause. Um, maybe. So the majority of people seem to think not, right? So they seem to think the other way. They seem to think that both of them are causes, not neither of them are causes. Um, but, you know, we, 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 we could give Macri the benefit of the doubt here. But you might think, well, you know, why does he include this condition three at all? Why not just drop it? And and that's the one that prevents either from counting as a cause. If we dropped it, then, you know, they both tick conditions one and two. So, um, so then actually both of them would count as a cause, not neither, which seems like it might be a good thing. Um, and essentially the reason he can't drop condition three is because of another problem known as the preemption problem. So, uh, preemption um, uh, is another issue that um, doesn't just afflict regularity theories, but also uh, poses a challenge for other theories of causation, like counterfactual theories. And again, we'll see this in the next lecture. Um, but it does cause a problem for regularity theories. Um, so, here's a case of preemption. So... Suppose that Crime Boss 1 orders Alice to rob a bank. So Alice is an employee of Crime Boss 1. Crime Boss 1 orders Alice to rob the bank. Alice robs the bank. Meanwhile, uh, Crime Boss 2, who doesn't know about Crime Boss 1, orders Bob to rob the bank. Bob arrives, but he arrives too late. He arrives after the bank's already been robbed by Alice. Um, so this is a case um, that has become known as uh, a case of preemption, or this this sort of case is known as uh, uh, known as preemption cases. Um, so actually, David Lewis, uh, who as well as theorizing about possible worlds, theorized about causation. As I say, the two are connected, as we'll see next week, because Lewis advocated a counterfactual theory of causation. Um, Lewis, uh, I think, was the, the originator of, of this terminology, so calling these sorts of cases preemption cases. Um, so the idea is that Alice preempts Bob, um, or, and also, I suppose, Crime Boss 1's order preempts Crime Boss 2's order as a cause of the, the robbing of the bank. Okay, so we have, we have, although the examples are rather different, we again have two minimally sufficient sets of conditions in this case, uh, as we did in the overdetermination case. So, on the one hand, consider crime boss one's order together with the fact that Alice is obedient and maybe that she's highly skilled in bank robbing, say. Um, and the fact that the, the bank's not sufficiently guarded, right? So those those sorts of conditions taken together might be sufficient for the bank to be robbed, right? So they're enough to guarantee that the bank will be robbed. The trouble is, and maybe this is a bit more difficult to see, that uh, there's another set of conditions present uh, that doesn't include crime boss one's order that's also sufficient for the bank to be robbed. Um, so uh, this second set of conditions includes crime boss two's order, Bob's obedience, maybe Bob's competence, um, the fact that the, the bank isn't sufficiently guarded and so on. Now, um, I think people have more difficulty seeing that set two is a sufficient condition. And that, I think, is just because they straightforwardly confuse being sufficient for with causing. Right. So condition two or set of conditions two should not be thought of. And this is in general not the way that Mackey is thinking about sufficiency um, as a set of conditions 
sufficient to guarantee that Crime Boss 2's order is a cause of the banks being robbed. It's merely a set of conditions that's enough to guarantee that the bank will be robbed. And the way to see that it guarantees that the bank will be robbed um, is that given that it holds, the bank is definitely going to be robbed one way or the other, right? In other words, given Crime Boss 2's order, either Alice is going to get there first and rob it, or if she doesn't, Bob's going to get there and rob it. So Crime Boss 2's order ensures that one way or another the bank gets robbed and and therefore uh, the set of condition 2 is sufficient uh, for, the, for the, the, the bank to be robbed, for the effect uh, to occur. Um, it guarantees that one way or, or the other it, it will occur. Um, it's the sort of backup or fail safe, right? So given that it, it's in place, that the effect's definitely going to come about one way or another. Um, so both of these sets are sufficient um, for the effect. Um, now, it would seem like uh, intuitively, presumably most, well, I mean, certainly most people, um, think that Crime Boss 1's order was a cause of the banks being robbed and Crime Boss 2's order wasn't a cause, right? So as things panned out, Crime Boss 2's order um, was kind of irrelevant or, or was redundant because um, Alice got there first so nothing that Crime Boss 2's order initiated resulted in the banks being robbed, right? So what Crime Boss 2's order did was set Bob in, in action. Uh, but Bob was too late, right? So he didn't have a hand in the robbing of the bank. Uh, so people therefore tend to, tend to judge that Crime Boss 2's order was not a cause, while Crime Boss 1's order was a cause. So... Mackey gets the result that Crime Boss 2's orders was not a cause. And that's because of Condition 3, because there's a minimal sufficient set of conditions, namely the set 1, that's present on the occasion of question, in question, of which Crime Boss 2's order is not part. Right, so Crime Boss 2's order is not part of this set 1, which is sufficient. So that's why Mackey likes condition 3 of his account, um, because it protects us against getting the results. This is condition 3. It protects us from getting the results that um, the preempted backup um, is a cause. It allows us to rule out Crime Boss 2's order as a cause. But there's a problem for Mackey, um, and a problem that's maybe obvious enough that it's sort of surprising that he didn't say more to address it. And that is that his account, in virtue of Condition 3, which helped ensure that Crime Boss 2's order doesn't count as a cause, also rules out Crime Boss 1's order as counting as a cause. And the reason is because... There's a set of conditions present on the occasion in question that's sufficient for the effect, the robbing of the bank, but that doesn't include Crime Boss 1's order, namely the set 2. So just by analogous reasons for the, to the reason Crime Boss 2's order is correctly ruled out as being as cause, Crime Boss 1's order is incorrectly ruled out as being a cause. And so we get the counterintuitive result, at least counterintuitive to most people, that neither Crime Boss 1 nor Crime Boss 2's order were causes. Um, so the case is very similar, in a way, to overdetermination, right? So the presence of each of these sets, so the presence of set 1 ruled out the petrol bomb from being a cause, the presence of set 2 
rules out the lightning strike from being a cause of uh, the the fire. Um, in symmetric over determination, we thought, well, you know, maybe it would be better if both counted as causes, but maybe we can live with neither being causes. Symmetric over determination is a bit, bit, bit odd, so, so fine, but um, but here it really seems that we can't just tolerate that, right? So here clearly we want to say that crime boss one's order was a cause, crime boss two's order was not a cause, and yet very similarly. The presence of this set two rules out crime boss one's order from being a cause, whereas the presence of set one rules out crime boss two's order from being a cause. So we seem to have a problem, right? So, yeah, the question, why doesn't Mackie just drop requirement three? Um, well, he needs requirement three to rule out, to correctly rule out crime boss two's order. But the problem is if he incorporates requirement three, then he rules out uh, crime boss one's order so he as it were throws the baby out with the bathwater. so this is a big problem for um the perhaps the most sophisticated um regularity theory of causation um namely mackie's right it seems very difficult to deal correctly with preemption cases we're liable either to get the the result both that the real cause was a cause but that the backup was also a cause that would be if we rejected Mackey's condition three or we get the result that neither were causes which again seems incorrect so so a, a significant problem for uh Mackey's account uh which in a way represents the zenith of the regularity theories of causation now what we'll see is that actually overdetermination preemption cases are really difficult um, and um, they will see next lecture that they, they also pose this significant obstacle to counterfactual cancer causation too. Um, there has been more said, it has, has to be admitted, um, within the counterfactual tradition about ways in which we can respond to these um, problems of preemption and overdetermination. Less has been said within a regularity tradition. So one thing to keep an eye on as we go forward is whether any of the answers that come up uh, when we discuss a counterfactual approach might be applied uh, in a bid to save the, the regularity approach um, um, uh, if one, you know, favours that, right? So. Um, some people do favor the regularity approach and um, partly that's because regularities are a very sort of um, straightforward empirical this worldly thing that we can observe whereas counterfactuals we've said counterfactuals connect to modality and possible worlds and possible worlds as we've seen are a rather more mysterious entity so uh, so it's well worth thinking about whether uh, as we go on whether uh, the regularity approach could be saved um, in a manner analogous to the counterfactual approach. But that's it for, for this time. Um, so the reading for next time uh, is on the slide um, and um, as well as the usual reading from Lowe, uh, we've got this uh, highly influential paper called Causation by David Lewis of extreme modal realism fame. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, so I will speak to you all again next week. Uh, have a, uh, Actually, after reading week is the next lecture. So in the meantime, have, ha, uh, have a good reading week. Um, and I will speak to you again soon. Bye.